Welcome to the Positive Spiritual Living Podcast, brought to you by Unity on the Bay. This is your positive path for spiritual living. The fable being this, that as we grow spiritually, our lives become easier. Did you think that was true? That as you awaken to your spiritual nature and your spiritual identity, your life becomes easier. I always operated um, under that what I now believe to be a fallacy. I thought that if I was doing it right, life would be a cakewalk. And so when people would come to me with acres of problems and challenges, I would benevolently say to them, well, let's take a look at your consciousness and see what perhaps is drawing these unfortunate circumstances into your life so that we can work on repairing the situation. <laughs> I was truly a novice at that point, my friends. Now when somebody comes into my office and says, I have acres and acres of problems and difficulties and challenges, you know what I say to them? Congratulations! <laughs> because the spiritual journey, the journey of awakening, is not necessarily a cakewalk, my friends. The, spiritual, uh, the journey of spiritual awakening involves you and me really coming face to face with all of the erroneous and false ideas we've ever held about ourselves and other people. And I have found most especially this year to be like a commemorative year for me because a lot of you know that I've had my share of challenges. They've at least touched me by people that I love and share great concern for. My best friend, Kevin Rice, who had the... Uh, two brain surgeries this year, and thank God he's doing well. He was here a few weeks ago, and I'm grateful, grateful, grateful for that. My mother has been through a number of health challenges, the last of which occurred just this past week when I received a telephone call from uh, the center where she lives, and they had said that she had been rushed to the emergency room at Mount Sinai, and so I headed in that direction. I'm going to tell you quite honestly my first thought was not, thank you, God, as I'm always telling you, you should have pro professed, you know, in circumstances. Like, my first thought was, not again. This can't possibly be happening again. And yet it was, and so I started to make my way over, and I was concerned because I knew it was going to be probably an all-night event and into the next day, and Wednesday's the day when I sit down to put my ideas and thoughts together that I'm going to share with you on Sunday. And so as I was arriving at the emergency room, I was concerned about my mother, and I was also concerned about how I was going to get ready for Sunday, and so on and so forth. And let me just tell you that a kind of an indescribable voice, and I think a lot of you know this voice, I consider it to be the voice of spirit or the voice of inner truth, spoke to me while I was there in the emergency room waiting, waiting to find out what the diagnosis for my mother was. And it said, Chris, it's no longer enough for you to stand up on Sunday morning and deliver a talk. You must now begin to live your talks. Live them. And I would like to stand up here and tell you, well, I always live what I profess. But mm, some of you know me well enough to know that that's not the case. You know, there is still a lot of room for me to bring myself into integrity. And so I took kind of a gulp at that point and I thought, I believe it's right. You can bet one thing. I am going to be extremely aware and selective about the topics I select to present to you on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Just to try to make the road a little easier because what I have found is it doesn't get easier. In fact, the more I pursue the spiritual journey, sometimes the more challenging it becomes. And I really believe that that's because the world is asking me and perhaps you this morning to re-examine how we define the challenges and the difficulties of our daily lives. They are not obstacles that cannot be overcome. They are opportunities. They are invitations for us to put this glorious teaching to the test. And primarily what the teaching is, my friends, is the question of who you are, your identity. And how well you're able to hold on to that understanding of who you are as you walk through these challenges. You see, you have to have something to, you, to engage in. You have to have something to get your hands dirty with, okay? Because you've got work to do. You've got clearings to create in your life. 
so that you can liberate yourself from having held to false ideas of who you are and really stand in the glory of your true identity as a son, a daughter, a child of the Most High. I believe that every one of us, myself included, has what I'll call a divine curriculum at work in our lives. And that is that if we keep our eyes and ears open to the situations that we encounter, as well as to the mentors and the teachers and the opportunities that are in our field of awareness, we'll begin to discover that there's a divinely orchestrated curriculum that is leading us to a greater recognition or remembrance of who we are as children of God. Everything is a part of this curriculum, and it is brilliantly orchestrated by nothing less than the divine, the almighty, the universe, God. For many years now, part of that curriculum for me, you know, has been the work of a man named Joel Goldsmith. And one of the things that I love, um, that's a practice of his that I've incorporated at different points along my journey, is to put your complete attention to the best of your ability about two inches above the top of your physical head, two inches above your scalp and to the back, and seek to do what I call this. Christ goes to the movies, okay? In ultimate reality, in spiritual reality, you are the Christ. Although most of us have bought into the idea that we are something less than the Christ, we are a physical body, therefore subject to physical maladies, The truth is we are spiritual beings and Joel presupposes that the greatest awareness of that spiritual dimension of our identity rests just about two inches above the back of our head. Now, having been one that practices that from time to time, I decided after hearing the voice when I was on my way over to Mount Sinai and told me to live my teaching, that through this experience with my mother that it went on for the last 48 hours, and by the way, I don't know how she does it, but she's come through a second repeat surgery of what she experienced in 2014, and she's here to talk about it, and she's doing very well for an 88-year-old woman. It's a slow but steady progression, so I suspect she'll be back amongst us any day now. Don't be surprised if she's here, but this is a major abdominal surgery, so it really took a lot for me to stay focused in my Christed identity and also see her as being identified with that same Christ presence. There's one of my favorite meditations um, available, by the way, on YouTube by Joel Goldsmith. It's called uh, Meditation on the Presence. You can look it up, Joel Goldsmith, Meditation on the Presence. It's a 27-minute meditation that always meets my need in any moment. Several months ago, however, after a difficult night, I was awake the next morning, and I wanted to do my quiet time, and so I went to the YouTube, and I um, tried to pull up Joel, and he had gone somewhere. I couldn't find him. And interestingly, what showed up in his stead was a meditation by a fellow named Muji. Has anybody ever heard of Muji? Some of you have. Interesting, and I thought for a moment, I'm upset because I want Joel Goldsmith and all I can get is Muji. But I had heard John, I heard you talk about Muji. I heard others of you mention him to me, though I was not deeply familiar with his work. He's a Zen master, and I wanted to share with you his words this morning from this book, White Fire. He says this. The password into this game of existence is, I am the body. The password to this game of existence, the password to your human existence and your human experience and reality is, I am the body. The moment you identify yourself as a physical human body, boom, you're in the human experience, okay? He goes on to say, All beings purchased this idea first, and the intuitive sense of I became mere flesh, blood, and conditioning. In other words, the moment we decided we are not this Christed being, but rather we are a physical human body, in that very moment, he says, we became mere flesh and blood and conditioning. Why? Because that's what we believed ourselves to be. This belief, I am the body, the doer of actions, the thinker of thoughts, is the most costly concept in existence because it exchanges freedom for bondage. As a spiritual being, as a Christed being, you have no chains upon you, my friends. The idea of lack, limitations, sickness, disharmony, or any such situation occurring in your life is impossible. It is laughable. Because from this higher space, you know who you are. And you don't mistake yourself for being a mere mortal being. 
The moment you adopt that definition for yourself is the moment you step into the world of human and earthly trials, tribulations, and challenges. Now, of course, once you're in that realm of trials, tribulations, and challenges, it's your opportunity to redefine those as stepping stones, invitations, opportunities for you to get back into the awareness of who you are, all right? So here I am, remembering these words of Muji, not wanting to limit myself, my identity, or my mother's identity to that of a physical body. To do so for me would be to look at her laying there in that bed as a very ill woman about to go in for a critical surgery that could take her life. And I had that option. We always had that option to become so compelled by the human identity, the human experience, the human appearance that we forget and we forego the divinity that is the reality of ourselves and every other person. I decided in that moment to, um, to do two things. First of all, to create this, which I've shared with you before in different formats. I call this a pocket billboard. And you can make one, too. If there's something that you want to remember, it can be difficult, right? Unless you could somehow write it across your eyeglasses if you wore such. I keep these little pocket billboards here, and they're folded over so that I can read them. And this one that I created for my hospital experience with mom says, two inches up and back. So every time I look at that, you see, walking around, two inches up and back, there I am. It's hard for me to keep my concentration and remember that I am the Christ presence and expression. So I need this reminder in my pocket. I don't know what you can do, especially if you don't have pockets in your shirts. But find a way to keep the thought, to keep the remembrance in front of you. So I adopted two statements I've shared with you on many occasions, and they are these. I am the Christ. I live in God. That's the spiritual reality and truth of my identity. I am the Christ, I live in God. Will you say that with me? I am the Christ, I live in God. Remember now that Jesus was our way shower and our example of one who lived according to his true identity, which is the Christ. And all of us have the ability to be expressions in truth. In fact, we are and have never failed to be the Christ in expression. But we need, you see, to remember this. So I'm walking around Mount Sinai, especially while I'm going through the process of her being away in the surgery, which was an all-night long, very lengthy surgery, long, long process. I am the Christ. I live in God. I am the Christ. I live in God. Fortunately, there was no one else in the waiting room. <laughs> but it would have been fine if there had been, right? Because maybe they would have caught that vision for them. I am the Christ. I live in God. To my mother laying there on that bed. You are the Christ. You live in God. You are not the body that I am seeing as an appearance before me. There is a Christ presence. There is a divine reality that is the truth of who you are. That is what I'm going to see. And my friends, when you see the spiritual truth of the identity of yourself and especially of another person, remember this. There is no greater gift you can ever give anybody than to see them rightly, to see them correctly, to set aside no matter how compelling, and God knows, don't we, that the human evidence can be very compelling. It doesn't matter. That's your opportunity. You see, the adversity, the heap of challenges that's arrived on your plate is because spiritually you have designed this out of your own divine identity to wake you up, to get free, you see, to liberate yourself from the chains of mortal flesh and blood and the belief that you are nothing more than a mere mortal being. Dear God, you are so much more than that. So am I, and so is my mother. So here I am walking around for 48 hours. I am the Christ, I live in God. Mom, you are the Christ, you live in God. Now the most incredible thing happened. And I'd like to call this little story, I'd like to give it a name. It's this, Cordedito with Christ, okay? <laughs> Porta detail with Christ. Here we go. I'm tired, right? I've been up all night. I need a cortadito. All right? So I go down to the first floor of Mount Sinai, great little coffee shop down there. They have cortaditos. I need one. I'm there. And I walk up to the lady. It's really crowded for some reason. A lot of people in the room. Like, what do you want? I'd like a cortadito, no sugar. What is your name? I said, my name is Chris. She said, oh, thank you very much. She writes my name on the cup. And I wait, and I wait, and I wait. Long line of people. I don't mind. Finally, I hear a voice from across the room behind the counter. 
Christ? Christ? Third time, Christ? And it's like, is she talking to me? All right. This little cordedito cup will be with me for the rest of my days. <laughs> Let me read to you what she wrote on the side of it. Cordedito, no sugar. Christ. <laughs> now you can say what you will about me, the lady, the situation, but is this not a confirmation from the universe? <laughs> really? Mwah. <laughs> Maybe we should put this up for the silent auction Friday night. I wonder how much we could get. A cordedito for Christ. Man, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I went through that, I was really in tears. I'd been really tired and wiped out from having been up all night and the uncertainty of everything. But it was like the universe just reached out to me, my friends. And you know, when you and I, when we really seek with all of our heart and soul to reclaim our identity as the Christ, as children of the Most High, as made in that divine image and perfection, being willing to lay down everything that human evidence has told us we are and lay down all that our conditioning has told us that we are, you will begin to find that the universe provides you with unmistakable evidence that your claim to your new divine identity is accurate. Whether it shows up on the side of a styrofoam cordedito cup, I don't know, but it will show up. Suddenly, as you claim this for yourself, your world will begin to echo it back to you, you see. And the other wonderful thing that will begin to happen is that other people will realize something about you. I don't know energetically or psychically what happened to me between that lady behind the counter in the coffee shop, but somehow I really believe we connected. Somehow I believe that energetically she knew that I was seeking to reclaim my divine identity, and she saw it in me, and I saw it in her. This is how it happens. You see, my friends, you see it in yourself. You're always seeing in other people and in life what you see in yourself. What identity you claim for yourself, you will give that same identity to everybody around you. That's why if your world is full of jerks this morning, I'm sorry to tell you, but you might want to look at how you're defining yourself. <laughs> and on the other hand, if your world is full of angels, bravo. But you see, this is the decision. So when bad stuff comes on your way, and I gotta tell you this, my mother has been my teacher as long as she's been on the planet, but the lessons that she has given me now over the past three years, as difficult as they can be, as trying as they can be, as emotionally exhausting as they can be, dear God, I am grateful for them. So grateful for them. So when difficult circumstances, when challenges pop into your life, show up especially unexpectedly in the lives of those you love, remember, 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 two inches up and back, who are you, really? And how much longer do you want to continue to believe that you're nothing more than mortal flesh and blood? that you're subject to all the limitations of time and space, that you're always going to be lacking, that you're never going to be enough, and God knows you'll never be worthy. How much longer do we as individuals and collectively as a human family want to hang on to those old ideas? I think it should all belong to yesterday. I think that it was properly sung. Let's put that identity behind us and start to move into the glory and the splendor and the beauty and the power and the grace and the love that we have been before this whole time-space adventure ever began. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Positive Spiritual Living Podcast, brought to you by Unity on the Bay, a spiritual community located in Miami, Florida. Unity on the Bay is supported by the generosity of its community. If you'd like to make a donation or learn more about Unity on the Bay, please visit unityonthebay.org. You can also follow Unity on the Bay on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for even more positive spiritual inspiration. Until next time, thanks for listening and many blessings. Namaste.